Hello and welcome to First Chapter Friday. My name is Eva. I'm one of the librarians at the Alameda Free Library and the book that I have for you today is called Phineas Gage, A Gruesome But True Story About Brain Science. Now take a look at the skeleton on the cover of this book. You see how there's a hole in the head right up here? And there's also a hole in the cheek right over here. You are going to find out how the skeleton got those holes and what happened to the man who owned those holes, I guess you could say, because they were his holes. Phineas Gage, A Gruesome But True Story About Brain Science by John Fleischman. And I'm gonna flip here to chapter one. And it begins, A Horrible Accident in Vermont. The most unlucky, lucky moment in the life of Phineas Gage is only a minute or two away. It's almost 4.30 in the afternoon on September 13th, 1848. Phineas is the foreman of a track construction gang that is in the process of blasting a railroad right of way through granite bedrock near the small town of Cavendish, Vermont. Phineas is 26 years old, unmarried, and five feet six inches tall, short for our time, but about average for his. He is good with his hands and good with his men, possessing an iron will as well as an iron frame, according to his doctor. In a moment, Phineas will have a horrible accident. It will kill him, but it will take another 11 years, six months, and 19 days to do so. In the short run, Phineas will make a full recovery, or so it will seem to those who didn't know him before. Old friends and family will know the truth. Phineas will never be his old self again. His character will change. The ways in which he deals with others, conducts himself, and makes plans will all change. Long after the accident, his doctor will sum up his case for a medical journal. Gage, his doctor will write, was no longer Gage. Phineas Gage's accident will make him world famous, but fame will do him little good. Yet for many others, psychologists, medical researchers, doctors, and especially those who suffer brain injuries, Phineas Gage will become someone worth knowing. That's why we know so much about Phineas. It's been 150 years since his accident, yet we are still learning more about him. There's also a lot about Phineas we don't know and probably never will. The biggest question is the simplest one and the hardest to answer. Was Phineas lucky or unlucky? Once you hear his story, you can decide for yourself. But right now, Phineas is working on the railroad and his time has nearly come. Building a railroad in 1848 is muscle work. There are no bulldozers or power shovels to open a way through Vermont's Green Mountains for the Rutland and Burlington Railroad. Phineas's men work with picks, shovels, and rock drills. Phineas's special skill is blasting. With well-placed charges of black gunpowder, he shatters a rock. To set those charges, he carries the special tool of the blasting trade, his tramping iron. Some people confuse a tamping iron with a crowbar, but they are different tools for different jobs. A crowbar is for lifting up or prying apart something heavy. A tamping iron is for the delicate job of setting explosives. Phineas had his tamping iron made to order by a neighborhood blacksmith. It's a tapering iron rod that is three feet, seven inches long and weighs 13 and a half pounds. It looks like an iron spear. At the base, it's fat and round, an inch and three quarters in diameter. The fat end is for tamping, packing down loose powder. Powder. The other end comes to a sharp, narrow point and is for poking holes through the gunpowder to set the fuse. Phineas's tamping iron is very smooth to the touch, smooth from the blacksmith's forge as well as from constant use. His task is to blast the solid rock into pieces small enough for his crew to dig loose with hand tools and haul away in ox carts. The first step is to drill a hole in the bedrock at exactly the right angle and depth or the explosion will be wasted. 
All day, Phineas must keep an eye on his drillers to make sure they stay ahead. All day, Phineas must keep an eye on his diggers to make sure they keep up. All the time between, Phineas and his assistant are working with touchy explosives. They follow a strict routine. His assistant charges each new hole by filling the bottom with coarse-grained gunpowder. Phineas uses the narrow end of his iron to carefully press the rope-like fuse down into the powder. The assistant then fills up the rest of the hole with loose sand to ask, act as the plug. Phineas will tamp the sand down tight to bottle up the explosion, channeling the blast downward into the rock to shatter it. While his assistant is pouring the sand, Phineas flips his tamping iron around from the pointy end to the round end for tamping. Black powder is ticklish stuff. When it's damp, nothing will set it off. When it's too dry or mixed in the wrong formula, almost anything can set it off without warning. But Phineas and his assistant have done this a thousand times. Pour the powder, set the fuse, pour the sand, tamp the sand plug, shout a warning, light the fuse, and run like mad. But something goes wrong this time. The sand is never poured down the hole. The black powder and fuse sit exposed at the bottom. Does his assistant forget? Or does Phineas forget to look? Witnesses disagree. A few yards behind Phineas, a group of his men are using a hand-cranked derrick crane to hoist a large piece of rock. Some of his men remember seeing Phineas standing over the blast hole, leaning lightly on the tamping iron. Others say Phineas was sitting on a rock ledge above the hole, holding the iron loosely between his knees. There's no argument about what happens next. Something or someone distracts Phineas. Does he hear his name called? Does he spot someone goofing off? Whatever the reason, Phineas turns his head to glance over his right shoulder. The fat end of his tamping iron slips down into the hole and strikes the granite. A spark flies onto the exposed blasting powder. Blam! The drill hole acts as a gun barrel. Instead of a bullet, it fires Phineas's rod straight upward. The iron shrieks through the air and comes down with a loud clang about 30 feet away. This is what happens. Imagine you are inside Phineas's head, watching in extreme slow motion. See the pointy end of the rod enter under his left cheekbone. Here we go. Under his left cheekbone, pass behind his left eye, through the front of his brain, and out the middle of his forehead, just above his hairline. It takes a fraction of a fraction of a second for the iron rod to pass from cheekbone to forehead, through and through. Amazingly, Phineas is still alive. The iron throws him flat on his back, but as his men come running through the gunpowder smoke, he sits up. A minute later, he speaks. Blood is pouring down his face from his forehead, but Phineas is talking about the explosion. His men insist on carrying him to an ox cart for the short ride into town. They gently lift him onto the back of the cart so he can sit up with his legs out before him on the floor. An Irishman grabs a horse and races ahead for the doctor while the ox cart ambulance rumbles slowly down the half mile to Cavendish. Phineas's excited men crowd alongside, walking next to their injured boss. Still acting as foreman, Phineas calls out for his time book and makes an entry as he rolls toward town. Something terrible has happened, yet Phineas gets down from the cart without help. He climbs the step of the Cavendish Hotel where he has been living and takes a seat on the porch beside his landlord, Joseph Adams. A few minutes earlier, Adams had seen the Irishman ride past shouting for Dr. Harlow, the town physician. Dr. Harlow was not to be found, so the rider was sent on to the next village to fetch Dr. Williams. Now Phineas takes a neighborly seat on the porch and tells his landlord what happened to him. That's how Dr. Edward Williams finds Phineas nearly 30 minutes after the accident. 
Dr. Williams pulls up in his buggy at the hotel porch, and there is Phineas talking away. Friends, workmates, and the curious crowd around as Dr. Williams climbs down from his carriage. Well, here's work enough for you, doctor, Phineas says to him quite cheerfully. Dr. Williams examines Phineas's head. He can't believe that this man is still alive. His skull is cracked open as if something has popped out from the inside. Accident victims are often too shaken to know what happened, so Dr. Williams turns to Phineas's workman for the story. But Phineas insists on speaking for himself. He tells Dr. Williams that the iron went right through his head. Dr. Williams does not believe him. I thought he was deceived, Dr. Williams writes in his notes. I asked him where the bar entered, and he pointed to the wound on his cheek, which I had not before discovered. This was a slit running from the angle of the jaw forward about a half an inch. It was very much stretched laterally and was discolored by powder and iron rust, at least appeared so. Mr. Gage persisted in saying that the bar went through his head. An Irishman standing by said, Sure if it was so, sir, for the bar is lying in the road below, all blood and brains. It's now an hour after the accident. The town's regular physician, Dr. John Martin Harlow, finally arrives at the hotel. The two doctors confer, but Dr. Harlow takes over the case. Phineas is a gruesome sight. Bleeding freely from his forehead and inside his mouth, Phineas looks to Dr. Harlow like a wounded man just carried in from a battlefield. Yet Phineas is alert, uncomplaining, and still telling anyone who will listen about the accident. Dr. Harlow wants Phineas to come in off the porch so he can treat his wound. Phineas gets up and, leaning only lightly on Dr. Harlow's arm, climbs up a long flight of stairs to his room. He lies down on his bed so Dr. Harlow can shave his head and examine the wound more closely. What the doctor sees is terrible. Something has erupted through the top of Phineas's head, shattering the skull in its path and opening the brain to plain sight. And that's where we will leave the story of Phineas Gage, a gruesome but true story about brain science. And I will let you take another look at, this is Phineas's actual skull, where the point entered and where it exited. And this is by John Fleischman. This is available to check out. You can go to our website, look up the title, put a hold on it, and it'll be waiting for you when you come in next. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you next time with another First Chapter Friday. Bye-bye.